And tonight we want to finish that little short three-lesson series by talking about uh, uh, what he has promised. So what he has promised. And we'll be spending a lot of our, our time this evening just in the Gospel of John, the beautiful devotional Gospel of John. The Gospel of John's different from the other three Gospels. All of them are inspired, but yet there's something that's uh, beautiful about that Gospel. And uh, we see John in his close walk with Jesus uh, styles himself as the, uh, the disciple whom Christ loved because there was such an intimate connection between he and the Lord, which we should, of course, try to copy in our own lives. But we want to talk about what Jesus has promised. I guess it would probably be appropriate to talk about what he's not promised. Uh, Jesus didn't say at any time that if you follow me, there'll never be any problems. He didn't say that. He didn't promise that everything will always go exactly the way we'd like for it to, so he didn't promise anything along that line. didn't promise that we wouldn't have debts or wouldn't have uh, difficulties and relationships or anything along that line. And and I'll be kind of touching on that point later on in our lesson tonight. But there are some things he definitely did promise. Some of those we see him promising directly to his apostles in tonight's lesson. And then yet all of those things I believe we can apply to our own lives. I don't think that you have many things that are in the Bible that are given as far as on behalf of certain Bible characters that are positive in nature that we can't learn from. I think everything also applies to every one of us just like it applied to them. So as we open our Bible, uh, one of the first things we want to notice is that Jesus promised peace. He promised peace to his disciples. There were two different artists who talked about one day a project of trying to draw a picture, or trying to paint a picture, I should say, of uh, something that would just kind of typify what peace would be if you were to try to put it in the form of a picture. So one of those artists came up with a uh, grandiose type of uh, structure where there was this uh, mountain, you know, you had the trees that were there, and not a breeze was stirring, and there was a calm lake that was there, and he said that was peace as far as he was concerned. But I believe the other artist outdid him, because he pictured a, a roaring stream, like a river, and then also a mighty oak tree whose branches kind of went across part of that river. The spray from that river almost coming to the lower part of those branches, and then nestled safely above where that river, the spray of it would be able to reach, there was a nest and there was a tiny little sparrow sitting calmly in that nest. And to him, that was what peace was. And I think that's kind of what we're looking at as we think about the Christian life. But as you think about peace that Jesus gives in John chapter 14, in verse 27, he says, I'm leaving you with peace. My peace I give to you. Not like the world gives do I give to you, let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Peace, I'm leaving with you. I'm giving that to you, he says, as a gift. A companion verse of that is in John chapter 16 and verse 33. These things I've spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you'll have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Uh, speaking of the world and Jesus they didn't get along too well, did they? The world wasn't very nice to Jesus. And, you know, he stresses in John chapter 15, verses 18 through 20, if the world hates you, you know, what are you going to do if the world hates you? He says, well, you know that it hated me first. It hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, you know, the world would love its own. But because you're not of the world, I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you? A servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they'll persecute you. If they kept my word, they will keep your word also. Following Jesus Christ, uh, what does that do for me? You know, there are different people that, that probably, in the name of religion, that's, that's kind of what they sell their religious product on. If you follow Jesus, here's what you will get. And then as a result of that, probably different ones may uh, go along with uh, whatever that preacher or teacher may be suggesting. And, and there are many people who probably get into Christianity in some fashion for what they can get from it. How can I get things from Jesus? Maybe we could even say, how can I use Jesus Christ? I believe that's low-level Christianity. In John chapter 6... That's, I think, what the people were thinking of whenever Jesus had fed the multitude with the five loaves and the two fish. And you can just picture what a scene that was as all that was happening and the people are excited and they are thinking, we already were thinking of him as being one who would be able to conquer the Roman Empire 
And now we see what he can do with miracles and what he was able to do with the loaves and the fish. And so uh, we want to make him our king. And so they even wanted to force him to be their king. They were striving to do that to Jesus Christ. And yet when Jesus spoke to them and he talked to them about how they should not labor for the food that which perishes, but they should be seeking after the manna that comes down from above, we know that many of those disciples did not walk with him any longer. See, they were thinking in terms of a servo-mechanistic uh, savior, that you can follow Jesus, and as a result, I get a lot of goodies from doing that. And we do get a lot of goodies from following Jesus. There's no doubt about that. But that's not the thrust of Christianity. After Jesus explains to them what they needed to do was consume him, all of his words, and follow his words, and follow the Spirit which gives life, many of those disciples didn't walk with him anymore, did they? They decided not to do that. And so he looks at his apostles and he says, and there's different ways this has been rendered in the original text, but, or as being translated from the original text, but one of those ways, and this is my favorite, is where he, he would say it in this way, you're not leaving me too, are you? You're not leaving me too. And so Simon Peter, as a spokesman, and he's always going to be a spokesman for the group, he tends to do that, he said, to whom shall we go? Lord, to whom shall we go? Notice Simon Peter may have made some wrong statements in his time, and he did, but he sure was on target there when he said, Lord. Lord, he knows Jesus is Lord. To whom shall we go? So he realizes there's salvation in some person. To whom shall we go? Because you have the words of eternal life. He knew that Jesus could give life, and he could give it here. He could give it throughout eternity. He answers very, very well. And he doesn't mess it up like he does in Matthew 16. Or just not too long after that, Jesus has to say, Get thee behind me, Satan. You don't savor the things of men. You savor the things, or you don't savor the things of God. You savor the things of men. So Simon Peter answered and answered very well at that point. And what's in it for me? What's in it for me? Those disciples knew that there was a lot more going on. When I say those disciples, I'm talking about the apostles. A lot more going on than loaves and fish. And yet that's what attracts some people to Jesus. And so they get disappointed. Now, there's a half-truth in all of that. Because you do get wonderful blessings from Christ, but that's not the sole reason for accepting Jesus and following after him. Maybe we could conduct a, a, a sort of an interview with someone like the Apostle Paul. Paul, what did you get out of Christianity? Maybe we could say, Paul, what did you get before you became a Christian? And he could say, well, at that point I had the peace of the world. You know, nobody bothered me. After becoming a Christian, I had peace. But it was different, a different kind of peace. And the kind of peace I had, well, I had half a dozen floggings. I had a shipwreck. I had imprisonment. I had continual flirtations with death. I had enemies who were in the church and out of the church. I had sleepless nights, I had heartaches, I had physical abuse and mental anguish. That's what I had. But you also had peace? Absolutely, I certainly had that. Christianity may get a person into more trouble than it gets you out of. And so if you try to sell somebody on Christianity from the viewpoint that this is a dandy life and as far as partaking of it, probably your bills will all get paid now and you'll get all those promotions you wanted and everything will be just lovely, it doesn't always work exactly that way. In fact, when Jesus came here, he didn't come here to get us out of trouble. He came here to get in trouble with us. And that's exactly what he did do. But yet, Paul would be the first one to tell you that Christ gave him peace. He wasn't lying when he said, I'll leave that with you. In Romans chapter 5, verse 1, he said, You have peace with God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So when you have Jesus, the first thing you have is peace with God. There are people out in this world tonight uh, who would believe in parties, and they would believe in alcohol, and they would believe in what money can buy and things along that line, but they don't have peace with God. Even if they thought they did, they wouldn't have, because peace with God is, is greater than anything the old world can offer. And when you've got peace with God, it wouldn't matter if the life you're having to live is one that's centered around sacrifice and hard work, and it may not always be the, the most fun thing compared to the world's viewpoint of fun, but it's the greatest life that ever could be lived. I wouldn't trade it for a million dollars. I wouldn't trade it for all the gold and silver in the world, nor would you as we live the Christian life. You have peace with God. And that's why we, we want so much to tell people about Jesus and try to encourage them to obey the gospel because we want them to have that. And you can't force somebody to want to have peace with God. But we thank the good Lord that there is a plan of salvation that is out there that we can be obedient to 
so that we can have peace with God. So you can pillow your head tonight and you can just say, like the little child's prayer, if I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. You can do that as a Christian because you are at peace with God. Praise God. We're thankful for that, aren't we? Having peace with God then causes us to have peace with ourselves. There are individuals out there who may have accomplished some great things, but they're miserable deep inside because they don't have peace within themselves. And that's because they don't have Jesus Christ. Peace that Jesus gives even enables us to have peace with others as much as is possible. Romans 12, 18. Did he have peace with everybody? No, he didn't have peace with everybody, did he? He didn't have peace with those Pharisees that, that were persecuting him. He didn't have peace with those who put him on the cross or the Roman soldiers who nailed him there. But Jesus Christ had peace with those who love him and follow him. And there are individuals today who are not at peace with Christianity. But as we live the Christian life, we find ourselves being able to make some wonderful friends and have an impact on many people who aren't Christians. It reminds us of the early church where they praised God and had favor with all the people. In Acts chapter 2, verse 47, Christian life is so wonderful. I was thinking about it yesterday. If none of this were even true, if we pillow our, our head and sleep, the final sleep here on this earth, and there was no awakening, Christianity would still be worth it all. But it is true. Because Jesus Christ, you cannot look at him as merely a good man. You've heard about the trilemma. He's either Lord, lunatic, or liar. He cannot be considered just as a good fellow who came here upon this earth and did a lot of good things, but he knew he wasn't the Son of God. That would make him the worst individual who ever lived. Murderers would be nicer than a person who did something like that. Jesus either, either is Lord, or else he was just a, a, a depraved, crazy man. And yet nothing about anything we read concerning Jesus reminds us of that. Or else he was just a liar, and if he was a liar, he was the worst of all liars. He was worse than the devil himself. What a horrible lie to perpetrate upon human beings. He's not a liar. He's not a lunatic. Jesus Christ is Lord. And by following him, we have peace. Peace, perfect peace. In this dark world of sin, the blood of Jesus whispers peace within. Peace, perfect peace, with sorrow surging round on Jesus' bosom, not but calm is found. Reminds me of that bird, doesn't it, you? That bird that's up there nestled in that little nest above the raging waters. Let the waters roar. No matter what happens, we have peace with Jesus. If we live, we live to the Lord. If we die, we die to the Lord. So then whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. Romans 14 and verse 8. James even lets us know in verse 3 and 4 that the testing of our faith produces patience, and patience has its perfect work so that we can be complete, lacking nothing. So even during trials, we can have that peace. Secondly, what has Jesus promised? Staying in that same beautiful book, Gospel of John, also there's the promise of the Holy Spirit. In John chapter 14 and verse 26, he says, The Helper, the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. This is not a part of the lesson, but I've got to throw it in here tonight. I couldn't help it but look at that verse 26. If he's going to teach me all things through what the apostles wrote and what is found in God's holy Bible, I don't need anybody telling me I need something other than the Word of God in order to get me from here to heaven. Because the Bible is all I need. 2 Timothy 3, 16, 17, it is the inspired, completed Word of God. And so I don't want to entertain notions that someone might have that they have an inspired book also that I must have an addition to, or an absence of God's Word. God's Word is all I need if those apostles were guided into all truth. Those apostles, no doubt, felt very frustrated. What are we going to do when Jesus dies? What will we do then? If he actually goes to Jerusalem and he gets killed and crucified on the cross, where does that leave us? What do we do? He says, I'm going to send you a helper. I'll send you a helper. I'll send you a comforter called the Holy Spirit. And he's going to tell you everything you need to know. And so in Acts chapter 2, of course, the day of Pentecost had fully come, and then the Holy Spirit then immerses those apostles with his presence, with his entity. And then Peter speaks, and he doesn't have to have a sermon note like I would have. He's got everything right there at his disposal through the power of the Holy Spirit. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, we have all of God's Word written. Spirit speaks expressly, 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 1. And we're thankful for that. The apostles had the Holy Spirit. 
But if you look at Simon Peter's lesson in Acts chapter 2, verse 38, after the people are crying out, men and brethren, what shall we do? Peter says, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for remission of your sins, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And we're told in Acts chapter 5 and verse 32, the Holy Spirit's given to all those who obey God. Romans 5 and verse 5, God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that is given to us. And then 1 Corinthians 6, 19, our bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. You go back to the Old Testament days and, and you think about the excitement of the people when the temple is finally constructed. God's presence is going to be there. The glory of God. You know what that name is? Call it Shekinah. That glory of God that's present there with the cherubim that is there. And so what a glorious time that was for Israel. Israel watches the temple get in a destroyed condition. You had people like Antiochus Epiphanes who defiled and desecrated the temple. It's then rebuilt again. And in the days of Jesus, it is there. Jesus, then, of all people, says, if you destroy this temple, I'll build it up in three days. Those foolish people decided that what he meant was he was going to tear a temple down. He was a temple destroyer. Not at all. What he was pointing out, then, was, was his body, which was a temple, a temple that was filled with the Holy Spirit. Jesus dies on the cross. Before he died on the cross in John 4, 24, he tells the woman at the well of Jacob that God is a spirit. Those who worship him will worship him in spirit and in truth. Spirit, Holy Spirit. And so I become a Christian and look what's given to me. I understand about repenting and being baptized for remission of sins and we are so thankful to the Lord for that. But too many times we may forget about that other part of that verse. The Holy Spirit's given to me as well. As a gift, a wondrous gift, a down payment on my eternal salvation, Ephesians 1. And I'm thankful for that. By having the Holy Spirit dwelling in my body, in the temple of my body. What an honor has been given to me as a Christian. Do I take that serious? I challenge us to take it serious because there are some wonderful things that go with all of that. One that is humbling to us and beautiful to us, if we can ease out of the book of John just for a moment and look at Romans chapter 8 and notice verses 9 through 11. You are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. Well, I realize that I'm in the flesh, but also in the Spirit, as a Christian, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. If anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he isn't his. If Christ isn't in you, or if Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. If the Spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his Spirit who dwells in you. And as a result of that Spirit dwelling in me, I have some precious things. I have sanctification. I'm told in 2 Thessalonians 2, 13, God chose you from the beginning to be saved through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth. From a negative viewpoint, sanctification means I put sin to death. I don't court with sin. I don't flirt with sin. I don't live with sin. I put it to death. And what a wondrous challenge that is. But I realize I have sins in my life. Romans 3, 23, 1 John 1, 8 through 10. But by, coming, by becoming a Christian, these sins are washed away through Jesus' blood. By living faithfully and walking in the light, 1 John 1, 7, I continually have a cleansing through the power of Jesus and through the Holy Spirit. I can't put those sins to death on my own. I have to have Him helping me with that. Positively, what I'm continually doing by having Jesus is getting closer and closer every day to being like Him. There will come a grand and glorious day when we all with unveiled face will behold the glory of our Lord, changed into his likeness from one degree of glory to another, for this comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. 2 Corinthians 3 and verse 18. I can't become godly without God. can't become Christ-like without Christ. And I cannot become spiritual without the Holy Spirit. Paul promises that this will be completed, this work of spiritual growth, the day when I get to be with Jesus Christ, Philippians chapter 1 and verse 6, through the power of God's Spirit will be changed. It doesn't appear yet what we shall be, but we'll know that when he appears, we'll be like him. We'll see him as he is. 1 John chapter 3, verse 2. Then I will love like Jesus. Then I'll be pure like Jesus. Then I will think like Jesus. Then I will be sinless like Jesus. As one of the beautiful songs John leads us in says, Oh, to be like thee. Blessed Redeemer, 
This is my constant longing and prayer. What is following Jesus brought for us? It gives us the Holy Spirit. He gives us comfort. He gives us counsel. He gives us sanctification. He gives us intercessory power. We thank our Lord every day for the blessed Holy Spirit. The presence of the Holy Spirit in my life gives me power continually so I can be changed more and more to being like Jesus. No wonder Paul said, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing so that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. Jesus also says, and you can see it throughout the Gospel of John, that not only do you have fellowship with me now, but I'm going to prepare a place for you so you'll have fellowship with me forever. But we have fellowship now. If you borrow another verse that's outside of the Gospel of John, Jesus says, if I'm a soul winner, he'll be with me always. Go ye therefore, teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you, and lo, I'm with you always to the end of the world, to the end of the ages, is what literally is given there. If I'm striving to bring others to Christ, he is in fellowship with me. He tenderly invites me to be in fellowship with him in Matthew 11, 28 through 30. Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden. I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I'm meek and lowly in heart. You'll find rest to your souls. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. Jesus says, I want to have fellowship with you. Partnership. I want us to dine at the same table. I'm knocking on the door, and I'm going to let's see if you'll open the door from the inside and let me in, because there's not a doorknob on the outside. It's on the inside where my heart is where our heart is to allow Jesus to come in and be in sweet fellowship with us. What does Jesus promise to me? He promises fellowship. And then I'm so thankful, as are you, brothers and sisters in Christ, he promises us a home. In John 14, I believe you have some disciples who are as crestfallen as men can be because they are now thinking about this Jesus that they've walked with, they've talked with, they've dined with on a daily basis. They've watched him do miracles. And now he's going to die. What is there possibly that can be left for us? Holy Spirit, we're talking about peace. We're talking about fellowship. But he says one more thing, John 14. He says, let not your heart be troubled. Now, I could say that to somebody. It might not mean a whole lot. But when Jesus says it, I'm all ears, right? You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it weren't so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come again and receive you to myself that where I am, there you may be also. Whether I go, you know, and the way you know. Jesus says, I'm preparing a home for you. What an honor it is to think that we serve this Lord who loves us so much that he wants us to be with him eternally in the beautiful place called heaven. Am I preparing my life so that I can be in that wonderful place? This evening, if you've not obeyed the gospel of Christ, it would be a wonderful thing to see someone become a New Testament Christian this very night. Then you can have what Jesus has promised. You can have the peace. You can have the Holy Spirit. You can have the fellowship. You can have that home that he's given to us and promised for us. Uh, come believing in Christ. Turn away from your sins. Tell the world, tell this congregation that you love Jesus. Be immersed in Christ to have your sins washed away. You need to come back to the Lord. I want us to pray for you about anything you're studying about, thinking about spiritually. Be honored to do that. If you need to respond to our Lord's invitation, we invite you to come to him. Let's all stand and let's sing together.